I once again welcome you to our wonderful campus. And before we start, I would like to give an introduction about what we are over here. I'm Anugraha Kuryan. I'm from Hyderabad. And I'm a fourth year BA student over here. Uh, I'm Snehali. I'm in third year BA B8. I'm from Bangalore. I'm Veda Vyasa. I'm in second year BSc B8. I'm from Anantapur district, Andhra Pradesh. So let's begin our question answer session. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> First of all, Namaskaras to you, Sadhguru. Sadhguru, I have worked very much hard to secure the first rank in common entrance examination and place me here. But my brother says me that it's my destiny that has put me up here. Is it really my destiny or my hard work that placed me here? Where's your brother placed, huh? <laughs> See, uh, what people are generally calling as destiny is essentially what they end up creating unconsciously. When I say unconsciously, as you sit here right now, as everybody sits here right now, there is physical activity going on within the system. There is mental process, there is emotional activity. And of course, the life energies are active. Every moment, they are taking in hundreds of inputs, whether you're conscious or not conscious. So if I ask you a question, since this morning, from the time you woke up till now, of these four dimensions of activity, how much have you conducted consciously? What percentage do you think? Few things. How much percentage do you think? Twenty-five percent. You are a very generous man <laughs> It's well below one percent. If you walk from there to there, there will be twenty-five different kind of smells that you're not conscious of, but the body registers and records. There are hundred different kinds of sounds that the body registers that you're not conscious of. Like this throughout the day and night, in wakefulness and sleep, this is happening. When you are only conscious of less than one percent of your activity, definitely life will look like an accident. Hello? <laughs> when ninety-nine percent of the things that you're doing, you're doing unconsciously, definitely life look… will look accidental. If the accident… See, it is so happened, somebody fell off on the street and had a brain injury, after that suddenly, they started working their mathematics in a wonderful way. But that was only one. A thousand other people who cracked their skull never recovered from that or they died or those who lived on, lived on much diminished. So being accidentally fortunate is not the way to exist. So whenever a pleasant accident happens, we say it's destiny. Some of you even say, God doing things to me. When did you make a partnership with him? I don't know. So, shall I tell you a story? Are you okay? This happened. Sherlock Holmes, you know Sherlock Holmes? And Watson went out camping and early morning, 3.30 a.m., Sherlock Holmes nudged Watson. He opened his eyes, what? What do you see? he asked. Well, I see a clear sky and stars. What does it mean to you? He said, well, that means tomorrow is going to be a wonderful sunny day. Then he asked, what does it mean to you? He said, it means someone has stolen our tent <laughs> So, 
we don't know what went missing and something may fall here and there by chance, but that's not the way life works. If a human being doesn't take it upon himself or herself to make their own destiny, well, they should have… they're still having an evolutionary problem. That is, they're still not yet fully there because being human means this, that we can conduct our life consciously. Being human means this, that we can craft our life the way we want. But this destiny business is a good insurance to handle your failure. Whenever you fail, destiny, destiny it's God's will <laughs> So this has been going on for a long time. This is not the fundamental nature of this culture. In this culture, we taught you right from ancient times, your life is your karma. Did we tell you or no? Nobody told you there is a God up there who will do things to you. We always told you, your life is your karma. This means your life is your making. No interstellar influence on you, it's you. Whatever, there are a million impacts on us. But what we make out of it is still us, isn't it? What is thrown at us is not in our hands. What comes our way is not in our hands. But what we make out of it is one hundred percent in our hands. I must tell you this. When I first uh, went to Coimbatore and uh, we started setting up the yoga center, this is a country like this, this is very strange. Now they are all clapping their hands. But at that time, simply rumors, oh, they're doing drugs, they're doing something else, they're here to kill the wildlife, they're killing tigers, they're killing elephants, all kinds of things, rumors going around, even media reporting these kind of things. Then uh, hundred prominent people in the town meet and then they say, this yoga is spreading like a disease. <laughs> these are the words. We have to do something. There some young hothead says, let's take a truckload of people and pull down the whole thing because the whole yoga center at that time was just thatch roof sheds. So they decided they want to come there and pull down the whole thing and be finished. Today, it is among the most prominent places in the country, okay <laughs> So, when they said this, there was an old man who is no more. The wise man, he said, see, you don't know who you're dealing with. I know this man. If you throw stones at him, he will build something out of those stones. <laughs> don't throw stones at this man. <laughs> so, what comes at you, you cannot decide. But what you make out of it is your thing, isn't it? This is where your dint is. This is where you are to prove who you are, because you can't decide what comes at you, but you can definitely decide what you make out of whatever comes at you. Thank you, Sadhguru. <laughs> Sadhguru, all through school and college, we are taught to give importance to ourselves, self-love, self-confidence, self-esteem. What is self-love? What's happening in your school? <laughs> In society, I mean in general. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they teach us uh, to give importance to ourselves to such an extent that we no longer know how to be humble. So can you please tell us how we can become humble again? Oh. See, there is no need to be humble or there is a need to be arrogant. Now that you're asking me this question, let me tell you. My daughter traveled with me, alone with me in the car, when she was three and a half months old. I drove all over the country with this little baby in the car. So she grew up in many people's homes. I made one rule, because everybody, this is a problem with adults, when they see a child, 
they pounce on them like, like predatory animals, they want to teach something. It is such a <laughs> everybody wants to do one, two, three, four or A, B, C, D or Mary had a little, little lamb. So I said, see, I don't want her to know A, B, C, one, two, three, nor do I care whether Mary had a lamb or not. <laughs> so nobody, one rule is you can play with her. Nobody is going to teach her anything. So she grew up happy. By the time she's eighteen months, she was fluently speaking three languages. <laughs> because nobody thought of anything she's listening. <laughs> she is not chanting, Mary had a little lamp. No rhymes, no language, no mathematics, <laughs> simply life. I thought I'll never send her to school, but only reason was because, you know, her age group is important. So, she went to school and when she was around twelve years of age, she came home one day, little disturbed about what happened in the school. Then uh, she said, you're teaching everybody so many things, you're not teaching me anything. I said, see, I'm not known to do things unsolicited. Now that you've come, let's see. See, this is all you have to know. Never look down on anybody, never look up to anybody. And she looked at me like this, what about you kind of thing. I said, not even me. If you look up to me, you will completely miss who I am. If you look up to me, probably you will make a picture and nail me to your wall. But you will miss the whole point of who I am. You must look at me as I am, not looking up. Never look up to anybody, never look down on anybody. This looks very simple, but try it and see. In your mind, you've decided what is good, what is bad, what is high, what is low, what is virtue, what is sin, what is filth, what is wealth, everything. Everything is already determined. Once you've done this, there is no way you cannot look up at something or look down on something. What you think is bad, you will look down. What you think is good, you will look up. If you remove this and just learn to look at life for what it is, you will effortlessly navigate through your life, effortlessly. Right now, this is the problem. You are looking up to some people, looking down on some people and trying to be humble with them. There's no need to be humble. Treat everybody as rough as you treat yourself. That is, if you're treating yourself rough. If you are pandering to yourself, Try with others, then you'll get tired, then you'll treat them rough anyway <laughs> Yes. So, this is simple. I'm telling you the same thing what I told her. It worked miraculously for her. Never look up to anybody, never look down at anybody. Just see everything the way it is. This is the fundamental of this culture. If you go to the temple, what do you do? Hi, what do you do? If you ever go to the temple, what do you do? Namaskaram. You see a man, what do you do? Namaskaram. You see a woman, what do you do? Namaskaram. You see a tree, what do you do? Namaskaram. You see a rock, what do you do? Namaskaram. A cow, snake, donkey, monkey, everybody namaskaram. Because fundamentally this is what it means, this is called vairagya. Vairagya means, this is not a… vairagya does not mean giving up your life and going somewhere. There's nowhere to go unless you go with that guy, outer space, they're going to send you out with a one-way ticket, I believe. <laughs> Otherwise, where is there to go? Wherever you go, it's still life, isn't it? So, vairagya means this, literally means, vairagya means beyond color. That means you become transparent. If you're transparent, every dimension of life can pass through you, but leaves you untouched. You can handle life to the extent you wish. What you can handle, you handle. What you cannot handle, you don't. But in your life, if you do not do what you cannot do, that's not an issue. But if you do not do what you can do, you're a disaster. The moment you think something is good, something is bad, somebody is high, somebody is low, 
many, many things that you can do, you will not do in your life, simply because you think it's bad, simply because you think it's low or high or whatever nonsense. So in our lives, this is what is most important because it's a brief life. It's a limited amount of time for the human potential to flower. In this life, here if you're choosing what to do and what not to do, no, everything that you can do must happen. What you cannot do, it doesn't happen, it's okay. Sadhguru, I'm a student from science background. Most of the religions in this world proclaims that the God has created human beings. But our evolutionary science is saying that human beings have come from monkeys. Which one should I believe in? What do you feel closer to? <laughs> Being a human, I think that I have evolved from humans. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, if you are someone who is on a reverse gear, then you must choose the first one. Your religious people telling you, you came from God because you're going in the direction, better not go in the direction of a monkey. Go back to God. But if you're planning to evolve, then better go with Darwin because is there room for evolution for you or are you super evolved already? I'm asking. There is a room for evolution. Huh? There is room there for is evolution. Room. If there is room for evolution, that means there is a possibility that you can become a better man than what you're today. So if you're going in forward gear, go with Darwin. If you're in reverse gear, go with God. <laughs> yes, because if you want to go on that path, that needs devotion. Devotion means… the word devotion comes from the word dissolution. You want to dissolve into your object of dis your, your object of devotion, whatever it is, you want to dissolve into it. So, in a way, it is a way of making yourself less and less and less so that you become nothing, literally. It's a wonderful way to live. It is not sounding good when you speak in language that you want to become less and less. No, when you become really nothing, you become limitless also. So devotion is one way to go. But you don't have that because you've gone through a little bit of modern education and you're beginning to think logically. Now, if you think logically, naturally you can see life has evolved on this planet, there's no question about that. So if you want to go forward, you must see just behind you is the monkey. One step backward, you will be right there. Better you move forward quickly. Because some of the scientists are saying today that the DNA difference between you and a chimpanzee is only 1.23 percent. 1.23 percent is not much of a difference, isn't it? <laughs> Not much of a difference, isn't it? But see, just 1.23 percent, a world of difference. Isn't it so? Just such a small difference. Just see how big a difference. So, one po if you're not happy with 1.23 percent, you must accelerate your evolution. The entire system of yoga is just this, how to accelerate your evolution. In every dimension of who you are, how to hasten this process. Now that you're talking about evolution, whatever Charles Darwin said, a goat could have become a giraffe. It took so many million years. A pig could have become an elephant and it took so many million years. And a monkey became a man and it happened rather quickly. To such a point, anthropologists are saying that there must be a missing link somewhere. It happened rather very quickly. So now, if evolution happened, when you were a monkey, you did not desire, I want to be a human being. There's no such desire in you. Nature just pushed you on. It's just life's longing. It's not a conscious thing. 
It's just life's longing to get better. From an amoeba to here, just imagine the volume of work that's been done. Incredible, isn't it? Whatever number of years it took, maybe nobody is very clear about that, it doesn't matter. Because it is a one million years, ten million years, it doesn't matter with our lifespan, one million is as good as hundred million. So it doesn't really matter except for academics. Whatever amount of time it took, from a single-celled creature to the human being, what a tremendous amount of work has been done. But now you've been rendered in a space where your evolution has to be conscious. Fifteen thousand years ago, over fifteen thousand years ago, Adi Yogi said this. When his seven sages asked, his seven disciples asked this question, how did life happen? You have heard of the nine avatars, what are they? Matsya, Kurma, Varaha, Vamana, Narasimha, Parushurama, Rama… Not bad from Andhra Pradesh… Krishna, Buddha, <laughs> Kalki <laughs> So, please uh, look at what he is saying. This is very much in parallel with what Charles Darwin is saying. First is fish, Matsya avatara. Next is amphibious turtle. Then he's skipping all the other small forms and coming to the mammals. The first mammal we're talking about, a boar or a pig, among all the mammals you will find, I can go into a lot of explanations, but there are people who hunt pigs. <laughs> Wild boar hunters and eaters are right here. They know the hardest animal to kill is always a boar because it's so rooted in the body. Even today if you behave badly, the girls will say he's like a pig. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> So if something is very crude, you say it's like a pig. So, first animal, mammal, is the pig. What's next? Avatara. Vamana. Mm -hmm. Narasimha. Narasimha means half man, half animal. Next is Vamana, means a dwarfed man. Next is Parashurama, a full-fledged man, but explosive and uncontrolled, volatile. So volatile, he lopped off his own mother's head. Next one is Rama, a peaceful man. Next one is Krishna, a loving man, an exuberant man. Next one is Buddha, who is a meditative man. Next one is supposed to be a mystical man. This is not about those individual people. This is just… these people are being used as milestones. This is the nature of development of life. In many ways, this is running parallel to Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin's theory of evolution is only 152 years old. Adiyogi spoke about this over 15,000 years ago. And… <clears throat> and then naturally the next question is, can we evolve further? Because you find… you find right now when you want to study for your examination, you wish you had little more brain. <laughs> Hello? Does it happen or no? So naturally question, can I evolve further? If a single-celled animal can become this much, can I go further? So Adi Yogi said this. This is modern neurologists are saying the very same thing in a different language. Adi Yogi said, considering the nature of the solar system and the arithmetic, I will not go into the elaborate arithmetics of this, the way the planet, the moon, the sun, these three are very important, there are other uh, six which are also playing an important role, but these three are most important. The planet Earth, the moon and the sun, this is why the entire yogic system is around these three aspects. These three have significant roles. Unless something fundamental about the solar system changes, he said your body cannot evolve further, but you can evolve consciously. When we say we can evolve consciously, I can show you or we can take you as an experiment if you're willing. Yes. Huh? We can put you on something and show you that your very fundamental genetics will change within a matter of three to nine months by doing certain things with your system. If you know… if you're willing, 
to give yourself to a certain discipline, your very genetics can be altered, your level of intelligence can be changed, the way you experience life can be changed. So he said, you can evolve consciously, but physically you cannot evolve unless something about the planetary system changes. Modern neurologists are saying something very similar. I will not go into the detail because of the time, but you can evolve. So, if you're going forward, choose Darwin. If you want to go backwards, backwards is not a bad place. If you want to go backwards, don't think backwards is a mm, negative thing, no. If you want to dissolve, you go towards God. If you want to evolve, this is one way. These are two different ways of doing the same thing. Uh, now we'll be having the audience question session. Audience are all sleeping, huh? Nama Namaste Sadhguru, I have a question for you. Where are you? Ah. Here. Okay, okay. Ah, here. You said that uh, Indians have so knowledge about everything. Bharata Vishwa ke guru anta na healthy western kade. You're saying that, I'm missing it. Ega nivu, Adi Yogi Bhagya explain madhadrala Sadhguru. Uh, uh, f uh, 15,000 years ago, we had that knowledge and that. Uh, uh, knowledge is great. Now, we have to go back to the next day. We See, there is no need to bring back anything. Always people are talking in terms of how to revive this, how to revive that. It's not about reviving. If you make human beings to live consciously, even now, they will speak the same things of Ramas, Krishnas and Adiyogis have spoken in the past. This is one thing you must understand. This is a godless culture. All the people whom you worship are people who walked this geography at one time. We worship them, not because they flew in the sky, walked upon the water or fell from the clouds, nothing like this. They went through life just like you, all the trials and tribulations, much more drama than your life. If we have to take examples, well, we can take Rama because uh, even today is having real estate problems. <laughs> after so many years, <laughs> after nearly six thousand and odd years, still he cannot settle his property. <laughs> so, this happened right through his life also. At a young age he became a king, rightfully, because he's a prince, coronated, became a king. Due to some political reasons, he's sent to the forest and he has a young wife. She's not a tribal woman, she's a princess, not fit to be in the jungle. Well, in your television serials and movies, you might have seen Rama, Sita <laughs> dancing and you think it's a, some kind of a honeymoon. No. Going to the jungle is a punishment. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I have linked, lived in jungles for weeks by myself, surviving in the jungle. If you stay there for a week or fifteen days and come back home, people won't recognize you. Head to toe you will be bitten with by insects and you will be a different thing. Especially if you take the girls, you cannot even recognize them when they come out. Yes. So, going to the jungle was not some kind of a picnic, it was a punishment. And as if that was not enough, this uh, Sri Lankan people came and kidnapped his wife, you know the story. This is not here, this is in Ayodhya. They took away his wife. 
After all, he's a king. If one wife goes away, he could have found another local solution, because allowed for the king. He could marry a hundred if he wanted. But the man loves his wife so much, he walks all the way down, not with an army, just with his brother, all the way down. She must have meant so much to him to... because there is no GPS location as to where Sri Lanka is. <laughs> So you, I want you to understand, it's over six thousand years ago. Then he gets there, builds a Tamil army. Tamil people are here also, I think. See, look at that <laughs> So builds an army, crosses over, fights a battle, kills hundreds of people, burns down a beautiful city, then gets back his wife. Then a few months of being together, living as a king, she is fully pregnant. In that condition, again some political turmoil happens and he sends her back into the jungle. He is not getting rid of her. This must be understood. He is not getting rid of her, she means a world to him. Not just that, for a king, for an emperor, wife is pregnant is a big deal because the hair. No sonogram? So you don't know whether it's a boy or a girl, it could be boy, it happened to be boys. <laughs> but he sent her to the jungle. Today many women's groups are asking me, Sadhguru, what kind of a man is he? Just because somebody complained, he sent his wife to the jungle, we don't like him. Then I said, see, do you want a leader in this country who will put the well-being of the citizens of this nation about the well-being of his own family. Do you want such a leader or no? That's the man he is, because it's causing distress to the people, whatever their own beliefs about her, so he sends her out. If something truly terrible has to happen in somebody's life, knowingly or unknowingly you kill your own children, this is the worst thing that can happen to you. He almost killed his own children. He fought a battle, nearly killed them. Fortunately, it did not happen. Then Sita dies in the jungle, never gets to see her, nor she gets to see him. You call this a successful life? It's a serial disaster, isn't it? But we worship this man, not because he's a super success, not because he can uh, walk upon water or fly in the sky, simply because no matter what life threw at him, worse things were thrown at him. But he never became resentful, he never became angry, he never became hateful, he never became vengeful, did everything just to the extent it was necessary, remained a balanced and free man within himself. It is this freedom that we are bowing down to. We are not bowing down because he is miraculous. Everything that can go wrong in life went wrong with his life, but still, life could not get him. This man is above life. It is that one quality that we bow down to because that's the only quality we have valued in this culture. If you have forgotten, I'm sure your mother and grandmother's conversation, if you heard, without uttering mukti, moksha, karma, prarabdha, there never was a conversation. So the only value in this culture has always been liberation, freedom, mukti is the goal. Not God, not heaven, not the pleasures of heaven, only liberation. Liberation does not mean you go somewhere. Liberation means you are here doing life in full intensity, but life doesn't leave a single scratch upon you. This is liberation. Thank you, Sadhguru. Now we'll Thank have a social media question. The first question, Sadhguru, it is from Brinda. Will uniform civil code be a possibility in India? I think at least after one or two generations of utilizing the caste-based reservation in education and jobs, the third generation should not be given reservation. Well, these are two different things. It's a two-in-one question. Uh, 
uniform civil code, is it a possibility? Well, we must make it possible. As long as you have a nation where different people have different rules, you will keep people different. If you want to make all of them Indians, there must be one law in the country. There is no other way you can integrate a nation. One law for you, one law for me. Definitely we will be two separate people, we will never identify ourselves as one nation. So we are continuously facing this problem, but we don't have the courage to fix it, it's time to fix it. Reservation is another matter. I know there is lot of resentment among the young students. I didn't get the seat, somebody with lesser marks got the seat, all these things. But we must understand this, we have treated a whole mass of people in this country for thousands of years like subhumans. Even today, if you go into the villages, they cannot draw water from the same well, they cannot drink tea from the same cup in a restaurant, it's separate. They cannot walk through certain streets, they cannot walk in front of a temple, their dead bodies cannot go through the village. When you treat people like this, if you don't give them some privileges to get back to leveling, level playing field, it will not be fair. But at the same time, entry point reservation should be there, promotion point definitely has to go, both in employment and in education. You give them entry, but do not promote them without the necessary credentials. This has to happen, otherwise we will sacrifice competence for reservation. Reservation is an unfortunate situation in the country because we have created a thousand years of unfortunate discrimination. To level the discrimination, this effort, have we succeeded in this in the last seven years? Well, a lot of people have moved out of that trap, caste trap. Of low caste trap, a whole lot of people have moved out. Many of them may be sitting here with proper education, holding good positions, it's fantastic to see that. But still, there is substantial amount of population still stuck there. So, as time goes by, we must calibrate the reservation. For different regions, it may be different. How it is in Tamil Nadu, how it is in Bihar, how it is in Gujarat, it's different. We must have the courage to calibrate it at least every three… every five years at least, we must recalibrate the reservation based on the statistics, how much the movement of population has happened from poverty to reasonable level of well-being. And to what extent discrimination is leveled, accordingly reservation should be calibrated, but it's a political thing, no political leader wants to touch it, because uh, election is a number game, it's just like going to an examination. Thank you.